let's talk about uh, switch gears from the antibodies to the TKIs. We mentioned uh, regorafenib earlier. What's its role in, in, in colon cancer? What's the data? Yeah. So um, there was a uh, very important study run by Axel Grothy that demonstrated um, the benefit of regorafenib versus best supportive care. Historically, actually, that's very interesting because before that study, many um, investigators and companies felt that in the U.S. we wouldn't be able to do a placebo-controlled trial, but in fact it was uh, very rapidly accruing and it demonstrated a benefit um, over best supportive care. And uh, to uh, Elena mentioned earlier, the selected population, that was a very selected population of PS0 and 1 patients who you know, in their third line after all standard therapies were able to get on regorafenib or placebo. And they, there was a modest and proven benefit. The biggest issue with the regorafenib is the dosing um, and the toxicity. Um, the standard dosing in that trial was 160 milligrams a day and you can get significant hand foot syndrome and um, fatigue and, and so many patients um, actually end up tolerating a lower dose and many physicians start at a lower dose because of that toxicity. Is a lower dose acceptable in terms of activity? Do, do we know that or? So that's the big question, and actually that's being looked at in a trial now. I think Tony Saab, mm -hmm. as well as Axel, are, are looking at doing alternative dosing regimens of regorafenib. I think what's happened, though, is when we first started using regorafenib, um, you would give the patients 160 milligrams, and they'd come back a week later, throw the bottle at you, and walk out the door mm -hmm. um, because it made people sick. There were very few patients that could really tolerate the 160. So that's been an education on our part as practitioners to really do education and close follow-up with the patients that if you're going to start at 160, make sure they know potential toxicities, toxicities and to call you early with them so you can either hold the drug or dose reduce early. There's also a number of uh, practitioners now that will start at 120 or even start at 80 um, to see how patients are going to tolerate it and then maybe dose escalate. And that's what Tony's trial is looking at is starting at the lower dose and then okay. escalating. So what, what about biomarkers for the TKIs? So. It's, a, it's a very uh, interesting uh, Point. So we had a phase two of, of serafinib, which is an earlier you know, cousin yeah. of yeah. agorafinib, <laughs> yeah. a little older cousin. Um, and you know, although uh, majority of the patients, you know, sort of stayed on the trial for four months and then progressed, but this is have a pretreated esophageal and gastric patients. A handful of people had a dramatic, actually, benefit. Either you know, one patient had a complete response to treatment to single agent serafinib. And in search of this biomarker, you know, I've sequenced their tumor, including whole exome, uh, and I can tell you there was not one obvious uh, biomarker. You're probably familiar with the case series in, in Lung where there was a complete responder to serafinib with ARAF uh, mutation. Mm -hmm. you know, we didn't see that. So again, uh, you know, my, my sense that even for TKIs, this will be a secretory biomarker. So, uh, building on the serafinib data, now we have the, you know, we just completed the phase two full fox regorafinib data, and there we used regorafinib with alternative, you know, uh, alternate weeks. So instead of three weeks on, one week off schedule at, uh, at full doses, we, in combination with 5-FU, as you, you know, uh, know it causes hand-foot syndrome similar to regorafinib, this dosing was actually quite well tolerated. And again, out of 37 patients, there is, uh, I would say probably, and this data is, you know, is, is still not published, but there's a, a robust group of people who are on it with first-line disease um, for a long time. Uh, and again, a dramatic response in combination with chemo. And so now what we're doing is we're sequencing all of their tumors and we have some uh, blood samples again uh, to try to identify and narrow down. Uh, you know, my sense is that patients with RTK activation, um, so the, 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 the chromosomally unstable uh, subtype of G-junction tumors tend to benefit more from mm -hmm. the TKI, but again, small subset, and it, it's just very sort of anecdotal data. So, Roy, we have a number of these um, VEGF receptor TKIs, all of which have been studied for the most part in lung cancer, but not in FDA-approved agent. They all right. seem to have some degree of activity, but they've all failed phase three testing. What's your perspective? Is this a, a dead strategy in lung cancer? That's something that I've led myself. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I don't think so. Um, you know, clearly, you know, they've all shown some activity, but again, just not right. hitting that bar, right. you know, um, 
In fact, one uh, detonative that we had studied. It know, did I, hit the bar. Actually, it did yeah, hit the yeah, bar, yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> but, but that was one where it was determined it wasn't clinically significant right. enough to move forward. Exactly. The drug exactly. is approved for medullary thyroid cancer. Right. So, so I think it's because, you know, small molecules, as we said earlier, you have the complexity of, you know, if they, they hit the target, but they also hit other targets. So then you get, you know, no, no additional side effects than you might get with the antibody. And then if, if the benefit's not that great and you haven't identified the population, you're going to be seeing a small therapeutic window. But I think, again, you know, as we've talked about today, these agents do have, you know, possibilities for use in combination regimens now. And, you know, what are the backbones going to be now in, in these different tumors, certainly in lung? We're, we're getting to a world now where we'll probably see immunotherapy move to the frontline setting. Um, again, you know, benefiting some but not all. And uh, there'll be other immune checkpoints too, by the way. You know, I think PD, PD-L1 is just, just the first of several. So, so, you know, I think that's an area where we can see some of these agents used. You know, we always thought maintenance would be a good idea, right? Yeah, um, yeah. You know, and again, it's hard to, to go to maintenance, you know, um, or adjuvant therapies when you don't really know in whom it works best. And I think we're seeing that in some of the trials. So I think, you know, it's you know, keep an eye on, on these in, in lung cancer. Um, but as of yet, they're still looking hard for their niche. One thing that I would just clarify for those who are tuning in from, from Europe, that, that they may be questioning why we're saying that none of them have hit the bar, where because um, from European regulatory agencies, nintetinib has hit the bar. Right. And um, it, to get into the details of it uh, uh, is probably beyond the scope of what we're talking about today and really would be uh, better for a biostatistician than a medical mm -hmm. oncologist, um, but that um, in the adenocarcinoma population, uh, nintetinib did show a survival benefit, and in Europe there is approval along with yeah, docetaxel in point, that setting, yeah. uh, whereas that approval is is not the case in the United States, um, and it isn't really an available option well, here. So the drug is approved for pulmonary hypertension. That is right. correct. Yeah. It right. is approved, just that's not right. for that indication. Yeah. Correct. Right, which I was going to say, Eddie, that's another very interesting aspect of this, you know, that Again, having effects, as we would expect, on vasculature. Yeah. So um, I think we need more creative trials, you know, different endpoints. But I think someone, I think, Elena, you said it earlier, we're getting more sophisticated in what we can study and how we can measure it. So, you know, stay tuned. Yeah. That's right. And nintetinib is uh, very well tolerated. We have a phase two trial in gastric that we're almost done with. And I can tell you it's easy drug to use. So I right. think it has legs. I can say one thing, you know, we're, we're constantly looking for new drugs. So one project that's been on my mind the last two years is this thing we call Lung Map, which is a lung master protocol. And Mark, of course, you're involved with it very closely too. And, and you were in squamous lung cancer, we're looking in the refractory setting for drugs that might have activity, you know, and the premise is to have a biomarker, but we realize many patients won't have a biomarker, so we have non-matched arms too. I can tell you that we have to be creative now. Trying to find drug or drug combinations is not easy. So I think the drugs we're talking about today all have possibilities, at least in lung, and it sounds like in the other tumor types as well, to look at combinations. We just need trial designs where we don't have to study 300 patients before we make a decision. We have to figure out how to do it in the first 20 or 30, maybe using more novel imaging mm -hmm. techniques, um, you know, surrogate biomarkers still to be defined.